Welcome to the Interesting Podcast, episode number 41. This episode is uh, my good friend Mickey Flint. Mickey is a, is a leather worker, among tons of other things. Um, but we've been friends for quite a while now, and uh, he's, he's done quite a few things. We talk about uh, him traveling uh, across Ireland, working in London. Um, he's an Arsenal fan, for those of you uh, soccer peeps out there which may or may not be a good thing, depending on your loyalties. <laughs> um, but yeah, I learned a lot about leather in this one. That was a big reason why I wanted to have Mickey on, um, besides just catching up with him, because he's great and super, super talented. Um, yeah, I think you're really going to like it. Uh, this podcast, apart from just like getting to know people, I've been learning a lot lately. Uh, so I've been having guests on that have like taught me a lot of things. So I hope you guys have been enjoying that, because I have. It's been really cool. Uh, but we go over that, the different places that he's lived, um, how we met, and uh, yeah, a bunch of stuff like that. Mickey's a really cool dude. Um, he is taking commissions right now for anyone that's looking to get any leather work done, and he does everything. Like, I've seen him do uh, D&D stuff, which I totally realized we didn't cover. So, Mickey, if you're listening, we'll have to have you back on sometime to talk D&D. Um, he does holsters, belts, all kinds of stuff. Uh, the info is at the end of this podcast, so check that out. Um, yeah, so you know what? Let's just get into it. Uh, the Interesting Podcast, episode number 41 with Mickey Flint. Theme song time. I was just playing some uh, Gwent. Oh yeah. Fitting for you, yeah. Right on, right on. I can't beat this fucking butcher. <laughs> I, it, it, it's just bizarre which ones like have decks that I can't beat. Of course, of course. Of all the people, the butcher, he's the one you got to watch out for. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Not that I would know. Uh, beware the butcher who's up at two forty-five in the morning. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> chopping up uh something you know what i mean exactly he's got he's got other ways of income so you're you're in new york now um or you well, work you work in new york yeah physically right now i'm in new jersey gotcha okay okay so yeah and just getting down my third cup of coffee so there you go should be human again shortly. Sweet. Yeah, I'm in Jersey. I'm about uh, shit. What is it? About 15 miles from Manhattan. Okay. Okay. Are you are you from New Jersey? No. Where are you from? Uh, I was born in Rochester, New Hampshire, New York, New York. Uh, my dad was born in Rochester, New Hampshire. Oh wow! And there's yep. also Rochester, uh, Minnesota, uh, Michigan. Yep, <laughs> they weren't very creative up there. Yeah, so I was born in Rochester. I lived there till I was like, till I turned eighteen, and then I was gone out of there. Yeah, <laughs> I went to school in Dayton, Ohio, for four years. Right on. What'd you go to school for? Um, undecided. That's <laughs> school what for went. school. That's what I went for, yeah. Sure. I wound up with uh, double majors in English lit and psychology with a minor in theater. Really? You know, yeah, I, you know what? That actually makes sense. <laughs> no, knowing you, yeah, that checks out. <laughs> and, and, you know, so of course I went into sales because that's all I was qualified for. Yeah. <laughs> um, of course. But, yeah. So and then, I, well, I mean, I, I should I say I was there for four years. I, was, I did a, uh, almost a whole year in, in London. Oh, okay. As part it's, of the schooling? Yeah, I actually, it wasn't uh, like, it was like, I went to uh, a university college in the University of London. Mm -hmm. um, and all, because all those credits were just, uh, Dayton accepted their credits. Oh, right on. And it was literally the exact same cost per credit hour. What happened was I, I, I was undeclared until my, um, 
as long as I could be, to be honest with you, because yeah. I had no idea what I wanted to do. Sure. At the end of, uh, you know, beginning of your junior year, you have to declare. And it was towards the end of my sophomore year, and I, I had dropped too many classes. Ah. Uh. Take uh, 17 hours, um, which was the maximum amount of credit hours you could take without having to pay extra. Oh, right so, on. So I would take 17 every uh, thing because I didn't know, you know, I would take stuff that would seem like, well, this is crazy. I don't know why I'm taking it, but I'll take it. And if I hated it, I would drop it. Right. Um, so that I would try to keep, always keep at least 14 hours. Uh, and that way I would be ahead because I had to graduate within four years due to the stipulation of um, some of the grants that I had applied for and won. Gotcha. Okay. So I made a calculational error. Um, and because of it wasn't just about credit hours; it was also about certain things that I was going to have to take sure. if I wanted to declare psychology. Um, and I realized that I had didn't have it wasn't going to work out, so I was going to have to take a semester, summer semester. And right. I walked down to the registrar's office, and as I'm passing, it's all like you know, all these sister schools all over on the world mm-hmm. have posters up. And uh, out of curiosity, while I was waiting, I grabbed one of the, the brochures for it. I looked at the credit hour cost, and I was like, well, that seems pretty reasonable. Sure. And I got up to the window, and I go, what is the summer se- session credit hours going to cost? And it was literally the exact same thing. Wow. And it took a nanosecond for me to make that decision. I'm like, oh, <laughs> Gone. Right? Uh, I'll be back. Before yeah. I, it doesn't go through. <laughs> You know, this is pre-internet and all that, so you know I had to write, you know, actual hard snail ladders and all that shit. But sure, you took a sailboat, you got you stowed away on a barge with supplies to get to London. Uh, you actually used a homing pigeon to get the. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, to, you know. That's what, yeah, you sent a raven. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so I wound up doing that, which was pretty cool. That was a great experience. Yeah, that's it. neat. Well, how was so what? Uh, what time was this? Like, what year were you in London? Oh, I'm going to date myself. Uh, 1990. <laughs> 1990. That was uh, a year before I was born. <laughs> there you go. How was it then? Have you been back since? A lot looser. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I went back. Uh, yeah, I've been back a couple times, actually. I've been back uh, I've been back for work. Oh, right on. For uh, Parsons Brinkerhoff large engineering firm and I was actually on their pursuit team for the build out prior to the 2012 Olympics. Uh, they actually won it and, uh, built all the infrastructure for all the games, you know, right. the, the huge, uh, East London build up. They, they actually won all out. And I was on the team, uh, that was going over there trying to win that work. Sure. I was, I, think I was like 35 at the time. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so I this think was, I was last week. The next, uh, yeah, right. <laughs> the, next, uh, the next youngest person I think was sixty. Really? Yeah, I was like the snot nosed little <laughs> marketing guy. Sure, sure. Um, but yeah, it was cool. That's pretty neat. I, used, I used, yeah, I used to go. I would. I was living in uh, Boulder, working in Denver at the time, so I'd fly from Denver to London, straight, straight shot, and uh, so How I would go. That? Like, it was a long flight. It was a long flight. Yeah, it was like, a, <laughs> it's like nine hours. Sheesh. Yeah, that is bonkers. The longest yeah. flight I ever went on was six and a half hours, and it was a straight shot from Miami to San Francisco. Mm-hmm. And, and then I think uh, it was six and a half hours as well from Newark, New Jersey to Dublin. But with the time difference, oh, it shouldn't have been. It was twelve hours. Really, it was six and a half it hours. Was... I thought that flight was like. Uh, I thought that flight was like five and a half. It was like a whatever the time difference was that makes it uh, the, like yeah, seven to seven. Yeah, in, yeah. Because Eastern, Eastern Standard to uh, to uh, GMT is five hours. Correct. So we did five out of twelve because we did we we left at seven p.m. and mm-hmm. then and then got there at seven a.m. Yeah. the next calendar day. So with the time difference and the flight time, it was weird. As we 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 landed at seven a.m. Got out of customs by eight, and we're in the Guinness Brewery by eleven. Yeah, I have a similar. I mean, when I I've never flown into Do, uh, to Dublin, I always take the ferry over from England, yeah. which is also an overnighter. Yep, yep. We I took the overnighter from the ferry from Dublin into Holyhead. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I took that one. 
Yeah, I do it the other way. Gotcha. So, okay. Right on. Yeah, we would go, we get over there, and uh, yeah, the first place we go, because the, the Guinness Brewery actually opens at nine. Yep. I don't know why you waited till eleven. But, yeah, uh, <laughs> we had to, we had to find it from the airport. And... <laughs> yeah, we were there at eleven at nine. Did the first tour, you know how they give you that little coupon, right? Oh little, yes, little for, ticket for the sky bar at the top. Well, back then there was just it was this huge long bar. It was had to be almost like fifty yards long. It was just this one straight room, and it was this huge thing. And they had probably twenty girls, and they were all women. 20 um, right on the uh, bar just all they did was fill them fill up pints and put them up on the bar and another person would be there taking the ticket and handing you and so there was four of us in and they never took our tickets the first round what so after that what we do is one person would go up with all four tickets and uh, they would just hand you know you would just grab four beers and they never took the ticket and we sat there from we took the tour at nine, so we were in the pub by ten a.m. We left around three thirty in the afternoon. <laughs> that is <Lit>. great, <laughs> absolutely lit. So of course we go to St. Patrick's Cathedral, of course, <laughs> and I I get in the whole argument with them, you know, because you're not allowed in without giving a quote unquote donation. Oh yes, found that uh, out the hard way. I gave them. Uh, oh, I was giving them what for too about you know. <laughs> Quoting, you know, Jesus on the steps of the temple and sure. the money and all that, and yeah. Oh yeah, we I had to pay like all if you 15... want, you fleece and ruddy bastards, you know. Yeah, it was like I think I had to pay like fifteen euros just to get in. Yeah, it was ridiculous. It was and nuts. I remember, I remember calling them a bunch of, you know, they might as well be English, which was the worst, <laughs> which was the worst insult I could think of at the time. Oh, no, that's to- that's uh, horrible. How? Yeah, sure. You can so you're the only person I've talked to who can also attest to this. How good is Guinness there versus here? It's like a totally different drink, right? Well, you know the, that's not necessarily a locational thing, right? And it's, what it's is water in it? There's two reasons why it's so good in the brewery, right? A, it's because it's so fresh, mm-hmm. and B, it's because once they tap it and turn on the tap, they never turn off the tap. They just fill, fill, fill. So what st- most stouts, but especially Guinness, sure. uh, will separate overnight if left. It'll actually settle. Oh, and I didn't know that. Tops are bitter. So if you're, you're drinking out of a keg that is seldom tapped, like a place that doesn't serve a lot of Guinness, sure. it's going to taste bitter right? If, for the first half of the keg and then a little bit heavy and you know not quite right at the bottom of the keg. So – when you pour Guinness, it constantly it starts to stir, stir it right because of nitrogen and it turns the the the, the uh, stout inside the keg. So at the Guinness brewery, especially, they ne- they literally never turn things off. They're right. constantly filling them, you know, filling up five or six at a time after after each, so that they settle correctly. Right. So that's why that tastes so good there. Um, but if you find a place that you're lucky enough that's constantly pouring Guinness all day long, um, it tastes a lot closer. I didn't know that because I knew it tasted different. I didn't know that's why. That's really cool, actually. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Because here is another no- a little known fact. If and I don't know how much you traveled around in Ireland. And this uh, is all of it. Back <laughs> I did thirteen hundred miles in like twelve days. Oh, see, I was there for thirty days. Oh, uh, lucky. So back- so I just like got up in the morning and went, you know, wandered wherever the hell I wanted to. That's amazing. Uh, so there were a lot of mornings I find myself being, you know, walking into a pub, you know, early, early. Sure, it's where you eat. And uh, there would always be at least two old gaffers in there uh, arguing with each other. Oh yeah. <laughs> about who was going to drink the first one because the first pint of Guinness every day in the pub is free. Oh. And, and no one wants it. Yeah. <laughs> it's the worst pint of the day. Right, because it's, because it's just what I was telling it's you. It's been settling, Stop. right? So <laughs> I, being the uncouth Yank, fell on the sword just about every day. Yeah, <laughs> I always would drink the free uh, first pint of Guinness every day, which ironically I did because I was broke and I, you know, I didn't have any money. Of but course. it made me, you know, makes you a, a local hero. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, that is amazing. So, yeah. Did you do your traveling around Ireland while you were in school in London? You no, to... I had 
finished I had finished up uh, everything and I went over. Now my my student visa had expired about five days after I got to Ireland. Uh huh. And you know I didn't think anything of it at all until I came oh boy. <laughs> back into the UK and and you know I was one of thirty the you know one in thirty that they randomly grab and look at your stuff. Of course. And, uh, you know, I get, you know, bulging backpack that I lived out of for the last six months. And, uh, yeah. And they were like, this is expired, you know, blah, 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 blah. and I was like, look it, man, I'm going into London. I've got tickets to go see the cure <laughs> and then I'm getting on my flight. That's all I'm doing. And I'm like, don't. And they like, they just kind of laugh. They did. That was their reaction to They kind of laughed at me. Right. And, like they're like, we're gonna keep your passport. It'll be waiting for you at Heathrow. You have to check in to get it. Um, so that, that's you know now. Good God, could you imagine now? Not at all. And uh, yeah, so I went into London and just stayed with my friend at uh, their flat and went and saw the Cure. And ironically, I had flown like this super duper student cut rate flight that I had found. Which meant that you will get bumped off of every flight if anybody has any more claim to a seat than you do. Oh man! So I wound up getting bumped off of all my like like two days worth of flights. Oh no! <laughs> and, by the, and I had like ran out of money completely by the time I got to Heathrow. Uh huh. And uh, they wouldn't give me my passport back until I got on the plane, so I couldn't leave Heathrow. Oh uh, no. So I basically was uh, like that Tom Hanks movie. Yeah, uh, you're the terminal. <laughs> yeah, for for two days. And then when I got back to JFK, I, because I was two days bumped, uh, mm-hmm. my connection flight to Rochester. You know, so I had to sleep one night in uh, in JFK, too. Sure. I, I spent a night in the Dublin airport, and uh, it's not great. Sleeping in airports is not the most fun thing in the world. Heathrow wasn't so bad because like, there's always um, – Anywhere you go in England, there's always uh, Australians on walkabout. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Literally everywhere. And they are, like, literally the most friendly people in the world. And, like, you know, I wouldn't spend an hour anywhere that I didn't have new Australian friends. Yeah. <laughs> and, of course, you know, in the airport, flying similar type of things with these bunch of Australians. And, you know, you make friends and you watch each other's backs and your bags. And, you know, it's not that big of a deal. Sure. So, you know, being in Heathrow wasn't such – it wasn't as scary. It was like camping, you know, or glamping or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Who wants to call it now? But in JFK, dude, that was fucking terrifying. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't imagine. <laughs> in fact, and here's the difference between then and now. I was so worried about getting mugged or rolled over in my sleep and all my shit getting stolen that I actually went out a door out onto the tarmac, mm-hmm. got got inside of one of those uh, baggage carrier cart things <laughs> and pulled the door down and I slept in one of those. That is amazing. Yeah, yeah, I did that and uh, it started, you know, some, they started hooking it all up. I could feel them and I jumped out and I'm like, hey, you're not supposed to be here. And I'm like, yeah, sorry. <laughs> and I and walked back up and I went back in the terminal. That is amazing. Yeah, considering <laughs> the way things are now, could you freaking imagine? Oh, man. It would, be... would arrest my ass in a heartbeat. You wouldn't even make it to the baggage claim thing. What's he doing? No, I'd man. been tossed and stuffed 12 times over for that. Oh, for sure. That is bonkers. Make, hey, it makes for a good story, though. Yeah. <laughs> so what, uh, so you've done, you've done quite a bit of traveling. What, uh, what would you say is your favorite place you've been? When I was just traveling? Or traveling at all, because you've done a lot of traveling. You've been a yeah, lot of places, Mickey Flint. I tend to go live a lot of places. Um, sure. As opposed to, I mean, I love Santa Fe. Yeah. Uh, I would go to Santa Fe. When I lived in um, Colorado, I'd go down to Santa Fe every fifth weekend or so. Really? I would stay in Santa Fe. What's yeah, down like, there? Uh, just, the, just the architecture, the climate, the culture. It's a good really place. Cool. Oh, yeah, dude, it's awesome. Best margaritas too you'll ever have. Really, I have oh. not been. Oh my god! Really? Yeah, I haven't made it that far west yet. I made it to Texas. I've been yes. all over Texas, which, uh, you know, it's a place. <laughs> it's yeah. Flat. I don't want. I don't know if we're uh, you know who's listening to any of this if we're recording yet or not. But uh, uh, we can I cut it say, out. <laughs> I wouldn't say anything negative about Texas. Yeah, I'm. I'm with you. I'm with you. you I don't. Know, I was a little kid. <laughs> I had stronger anti-Texan feelings. Sure. 
I wish I have mellowed quite a bit. But and that was because I would be I would ski a lot in Colorado as a kid. Ah, uh, okay. I have very bad experiences with Texas uh yeah. Texas skiers with yeah. their big cowboy hats and really couldn't ski at all and uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hear you. I I'm, I'm uh I'm the same. I've been all over Texas and uh not the biggest fan. But <laughs> It's a, uh, it just, it's a tough place to live. I mean, it really oh, yeah. is, just sure. climate-wise. It's like, oh yeah, you say what you want about uh, um, Florida being hot and humid and nasty, but oh my God, it's got nothing on t- at Houston. And it's like, oh, how they survive? I don't know, man. They're Texans. That's how. <laughs> there, there's there's a fil- there's a water filtration system in their hats, and that's how? why they're so big. And there you go. <laughs> you got to make room. That's pretty interesting, though. All the places you've been in Santa Fe is top of the list. I would think right off the, right now. I mean, I'm sure it changes. Oh, uh, of course. There was, uh, you know, Killarney. Oh yes. Know, oh yeah. Killarney's place. great. Um, there's parts of Scotland that I've, I really. Uh, really Scotland's like toward the top of my list of places I want to see that I haven't been yet. And I like, like, it was like little, in Scotland, and there was like this one little, little itty bitty town. I swear to God, there was probably, if there were 80 people who lived in a 40 square mile um, circle, it would probably have been a lot. And I, I just really enjoyed that. Uh, but then, you know, other places like St. Lucia in the Caribbean. Yeah. Love, oh, yeah. Love St. Lucia. Um, just for the nature of it. And, yeah, absolutely. You know. And not just the you know the the water. Most places in the Caribbean, you just think of the water, but that place, uh, doing interior hiking and in, in the in the pitons and uh, in the fo- rainforesty kind of area is just absolutely gorgeous. Sure. Were you I, w- growing up? Were you always into like adventure and traveling and stuff like that? Yeah, I was really lucky. My uh, grandparents lived in um, Brooklyn. Okay. So I was I would go down to Brooklyn anytime we had more than three days off. We would drive down and I'd spend that time in Brooklyn. So I got you know a lot of exposure to big city kind mm-hmm. of um, environments. Uh, unlike, I mean, most of the people that I went to high school with, I right. would say fifty to sixty percent of them still live in Rochester, still live in the small little area that they grew up in. Sure. Um, you know, which to me is like bonkers. I'm with you there. Uh, but I got to travel a lot as a kid because my grandparents in Brooklyn, they were uh, a doctor and a nurse with their own practice, and they right on. bought a big motorhome, big old GMC, mm-hmm. and, and we used to drive around uh, the country for like a month um, every summer. That's cool. I had – actually, by the time I was – I'd say the time I was twelve or thirteen, I'd I'd hit like forty-five of the fifty states. Really, that's cool. That I visited. Um, and then they retired to Albuquerque, so I got to know the the Southwest really, really well. Um, and I was really into Native American art and culture. And I mean, I'm looking around my my house right now, and it's full of still full of all my Native American art and stuff. Yeah, that's cool. And. Uh, yeah, so I get to travel around a lot doing that, and uh, so it just kind of ex- it, it opens up your mind to a lot of things, you know. Getting absolutely, other, you become more. I think it makes you a lot more tolerant. Agreed. Uh, Agreed. <laughs> Traveling just makes you a better person, <laughs> you because your your the world view that you have has to be open because you're seeing totally new ways of life. It's just it's good for you. I was really independent as a kid too because. Uh, you know, my mom moved out and left uh, when I was like 11. Right. My dad really was kind of, you know, expecting you to kind of fend for yourself. So sure, I mean, we were always kind of pretty self-sufficient. Well, it worked out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, with good things too. Like you know, I was in Boy Scouts, and I was only in it because of the uh, every month you get to go camping one weekend. Right. Uh, uh, and it was like every month, so even in the winter. Uh, we would camp with, and this is not like with modern great gear, right? You know, this is like old school freaking canvas, and thirty sticks. pound freaking <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I set that up in up you know Western New York snowstorms in February. 
Sure. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm not kidding. I shit you not. We actually had like these things look like dog sleds to lug all the gear into the where we would camp. That is awesome. My brother, I was in. I was. I did Cub Scouts and then I did Boy Scouts for like, I think a year. And then twelve year old me was like, I'm too busy. I have things to do. And my brother kept going. And uh, you know, wasn't the best decision ever made because he went on like these awesome trips. He did one where it called it was like Northern Tier. And, yeah. they, and they would, like, canoe from, like, Canada down halfway through the States. Crazy cool stuff. Yeah. How yeah, long? exactly. I mean, I only did it. I think I I think I, I dropped out, like, when I was 13. Sure. Like, when I started high school, I think I was done. But, right. you know, I, was, uh, I, I remember I was, like, a, you know, I was an assistant patrol leader. And then I had my own patrol. There you go. And uh, I had this one scout leader who, like, would be like you you know he hated me <laughs> he really did he absolutely hated me and that's fine because i thought he was a piece of garbage too sure <laughs> yeah, i thought he was just an absolute low brow you know whatever and his kids were just as bad and they laughed and he finally laughed and uh, the guy who was the assistant scout master mr pilot i still remember his name uh <laughs> His name he was actually pretty wall. cool to me, and so like uh, the you know, but and I guess you'll never mount it. You're gonna... Oh yeah, and I patrol when I finally got my own patrol. You know, we won the Klondike Derby uh, out of five, out of five hundred patrols that winter one. We won it. What? Like, and I was like, see, ya. don't mess with me. That's right. <laughs> 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 you just take the trophy and point it at him. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it was a good thing. You know, you learn you learn kind of leadership and. Yeah, of course, of course. That's good. That's good. But what it made you, it made you really self sufficient. Right. Absolutely. Now, if, you, if you can, you know, go get dropped off and survive for three days by yourself in the woods with just nothing but a knife and uh, a couple stick matches. Yeah. <laughs> which is literally what they did. No, actually, they give you they give you five chunks of raw meat, like cubes of raw meat. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that's how you get your wilderness survival in their patch. That is they, awesome. They literally drop you off with nothing but a compass, uh, a knife, five matches, and four cubes of meat, I think it was. <laughs> that is awesome. Oh, and a water skin. And you did have a water skin. Okay, that's important. Yeah. <laughs> I remember like the when you get into Boy Scouts, you need to get your totem chip. You're like, all right, this means you can carry a knife now. So I was like, okay, how do we get this one like immediately? <laughs> so, I forgot a totem chip. Holy God, that's that's right. going way back. Right, flashbacks. Welcome to the interesting. Well, podcast. then it's also you have to check out to be able to you know start a fire and Exa- fire yep. safety. That was the other one. Yep, fire safety. And, and then the when you get those two, you're you're you've made it. <laughs> well, then you can get your you get that first your uh, scout. Yep. Badge. Yep. Right. That's the first rank. Yep. And then tenderfoot. Yeah. And then I forget the rest. It was like life. Second class, first class, star, yep. life, ego. There we go. You're better than I. <laughs> My... I think I made it to life. Yeah? And it's only because they – allow. what got me up was the service projects, you know? Oh, yeah. That's why my brother had... never made eagle. Yeah, me too. I had enough to do it. You know, it's like, yeah, I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm not doing, you know – 300 hour service project Sorry, right man. i'm just forget it there's <laughs> girls out there guys forget yeah. this <laughs> yeah hey that's how it works so when you were in the uk and in ireland yeah. is that what got you into uh football <laughs> soccer no i played soccer my whole life really uh, yeah yeah i played uh my dad was a big baseball player and, and his dad before him. And my dad like played minor league for a little bit as a very young guy. And then he blew out his shoulder. Sure. He was Throwing curve balls before he was really supposed to be. Yeah. <laughs> so they, he put me into T-ball and that first year after T-ball when the kids start throwing. Oh yeah. <laughs> I, hated, I hated baseball. I right. Hated, I mean, I remember even hating it in, in T-ball and all that. But, yeah, you know, he was into it, so I did it. And I remember the first time, the first day that the first game of the pitch, I got hit three times. They hit me, smack like dog. Oh, no. and I, <laughs> that was it. I, I I was jumping out of the batter's box, you know, almost the entire season. 
Sure. Finally stuck in there. We made it to the championship game. Finally stuck in there, and you know, I think I got a hit and, and I had two RBI type of thing, and that was it. And I was, I did, I finished that. You know, we actually won the championship. I got off the field and I said, "Dad, I don't ever want to play baseball again." <laughs> <laughs> I've I want to play enough. soccer. <laughs> I want to play soccer, and I went out and I played. And I was like really little, little. Same. Same. I was really little, and I went out and didn't matter. I was I actually was really good at soccer, hmm. and uh, yeah, so I played soccer from the time I was eight. Uh, up until college, I walked on, and I was the last guy cut. Hey, there you go. And uh, which really bummed me out at the time. Mm-hmm. But, uh, in hindsight, I was kind of glad, right? As uh, I, I had made friends with guys on the team through tryouts and and you know those those two weeks that you're doing the walk on the whole thing. Sure. And uh, two of them actually lived on my floor. Oh, really? dorm and i never saw them until february Jeez. I mean, nobody ever saw them until february when they finally you know the season ended and they literally knew nobody man that's, uh, that's how those really things fun. work yeah so which is good that they you know i was on the floor because i was like oh well dude come out with us and he's you know let me introduce you around type of thing but sure um yes yeah, so i was kind of glad that i didn't yeah. but i played cl- i played club level through through that, and then when I was down in Florida the whole time, I was playing two and three times a week uh, pickup. Sure. Uh, but pickup against like with guys who are all like South American and Central American semi pro guys. Yeah, they're incredible. I've played pickup soccer as well here in Naples, and <laughs> there's always a team. And they'll come up and they're like, "Oh, you know, we'll just play around. We'll just play around." I'm like, "This is insane. They're doing like crazy." flip tricks in the middle of passing and they're shooting around people with magic like they're they're yeah. very 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 good oh, the ball, but yeah yeah exactly <laughs> so yeah so i played all the way through and my high school was actually very good i went to a catholic school and we were really good uh we made uh states all four years and we won states two of the four hey there you go and my uh my high school football team like american football mm-hmm was atrocious. Oh no! <laughs> I, think, I think they won. I think they won five games in the four years I went there. Really? And I still had to listen to shit. Of course. <laughs> about you know when I'm thinking there's you know they, yeah they soccer's oh. nothing. Right, win a game, asshole. I yeah, mean, exactly. that was like the pat answer, right? So you got to. That's right. Uh, so when I went to school there. Um, I had where I when I where I lived and where I went to school. I technically should have been a Tottenham fan because mm-hmm. I lived right, you know, a couple blocks from White Hart Lane. Right. Uh, um, but I met Tottenham fans, and I was like, no, no, <laughs> <laughs> you knuckle dragon meatheads, no, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, they were all thugs and hooligans, and they were just awful. Sure. Um. And because I was there, I started, you know, in the summer, it, they were off. Cause, right. You know, it doesn't start until fall. So come fall, um, I had other friends like, yo, you know, do you, come, you should come with us. We got an extra ticket. We're going to go up. We're going to go to Highbury. So they took me up to Highbury, and I walked in. And that's uh, where Arsenal's home. Field, yeah. Uh, used to be. It was about 38,000 people and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And you walk in, and... For 90 minutes, they are all singing at the top of their lungs. And if you've been one of those confined, smaller, you know, venues for 38,000 people singing that passionately, these songs, you know, it is powerful shit. Oh, sure. And I saw this love for the game and all that, and I burst into tears. And I, I mean, I cried for like 15 minutes like an idiot. That's I could Beautiful. I, I was just like, this is this is how it's supposed to be. Yeah. You know? that I, you know, love so much and that had been got, given shit up on for so long. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so that was it. From that moment on, I was an Arsenal. That's like, why Arsenal? For life, yeah. Right on, right on. There's a lot of Arsenal fans here, like, in the States. I know a lot of people that are that are behind them. It's, it's very funny how intense, uh, like, we think football here can get pretty bad, but over there, it's like, if you walk into the wrong pub with the wrong color shirt... You're not getting served. It's pretty. Well, it's pretty... What? 
I mean, if one thing you could say about an Arsenal fan is that you know we we haven't we've taken a lot of shit. For yeah. A long time. <laughs> so if they're Arsenal, if they're still an Arsenal fan, then they're a true fan. Right, and, right. Every asshole is a, you know can be a Manchester United fan. Right. That's that's like the you know the Yankees. Of football, yeah, they don't know anything about soccer or you know football, but they have heard the name Manchester United, so they're Manchester United fan. Yeah. <laughs> now, I'm not saying every Red Devil fan is like is like that. Sure, but and, but, but who the hell cares anyway? Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Spoken like a true Arsenal fan. <laughs> yeah. Well, that the is... Antichrist is now their manager, so you know, <laughs> that, tells, that tells you everything you need to know. <laughs> that is Best gold. This. Yeah. So I, anyway, yeah. Don't give me. Don't wind me up with that. I, man. Hey, <laughs> it's a party. It's a party. That's why we're here. <laughs> Welcome to the Arsenal Hour with Mickey Flint. <laughs> so, how many games have you been to since that one? Oh, in person. Yeah, that was, that was the only one. Real. That was just enough to give you oh, the shot. The Arsenal, Arsenal tickets are like crazy. <laughs> yeah. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's literally it's far easier to get Yankee tickets in New York than it is to get Arsenal. It makes sense, it, because especially because I mean soccer is like the world sport. Like we have countries battling countries every four years. It's bonkers. So I can imagine. No. Well, Arsenal tickets are the most expensive mm -hmm. in the Premier League. It is. A, it's a problem, right? Uh, and it is, and that's one of the complaints against Arsenal as a club. You know, it's very has a lot of corporate. You know, because where it is, right, in London and whatnot. You know, and more so even than the other London clubs like Chelsea or West Ham United, or because they built this new stadium, you know, to get out of Highbury, which, which you know, arguably was falling apart, and you know, but they built this thing that's all like you know, modern, you know, with boxes, sky boxes, and all that kind of nonsense. So. Sure, sure. That makes the sense. ticket prices. The tick Let's put it like this way: just your normal standard, if you could get one. Right, you're not getting in there for less than two hundred seventy-five bucks. Sheesh, I mean, because you know they're all season ticket holders and they put them up. So even if you of got course. them at face value on the ticket, you're still probably looking close to two hundred for the cheapest seats in the place that per is game. Bonkers. And if you're going to have to pay what you're going to have to pay, you're probably looking closer to four hundred, four fifty. Well, remember, you know, there's exchange rate. You know, going yeah, yeah, of course. Together. But yeah, that's about what you're looking at. That's so cool, though. Like that experience. My dad went to a game in Costa Rica, and he said like it was pouring down rain, and they just kept on playing through, and they're singing their songs and like stamping in the in the bleachers, and it's just a crazy communal experience. That's pretty cool. It's pretty oh, yeah. I mean, you play in the. You mean you play in the snow? You play. Yeah, of course. <laughs> when I was in high school, I actually had a pair of uh, screw-ins, you know, where you could take out the the cleat part yeah. and change them out. Uh huh. And I had ordered them from these things from uh, the UK. Actually, they were they had leather tips on the ends of the screw-ins. What? And that was for traction in snow. That's awesome. And yeah, because I had to play. You know, when you play in the sectionals, the states, right? Uh, in up western New York in November, pretty damn well sure you're going to be playing in snow at some point. Sure, sure. You got to play. <clears throat> yeah, we should take uh, we stick long underwear. And cut them off just oh, above the that's knee. That's awesome. <laughs> and wear those underneath our shorts. So yeah, that's they were great. Acted as uh, slide guards too, so you didn't chew up the when you slide tackled in near frozen ground. Yeah, that's sure. Rip your leg up pretty good. Sure. That's anyway. like snow burns. People don't realize that <laughs> the cold, not great on skin. So we, when did we meet? I know it was at a con. I think you came up to I'm me. Pretty sh yeah, because you, you're doing the cabbage guy. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. That was when we met. Yeah, had to have been probably at I'm uh, probably at Tampa. Probably. Uh, uh, yes, it had to have been. Yeah, that makes sense. It makes sense. It's one of the few times that uh, I can recall, you know, running across a convention to go up and talk. <laughs> <laughs> I'm usually on the receiving end of that. I see him coming across, you know. I'm like, oh, here we go. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, picture time. Hold on. <laughs> but no, I had to run over and give you because that was such a great idea and you did it so well. It was awesome. Thank and you. And that was always one of my all time favorites uh, watching right? Avatar because it was hysterical. <laughs> I, 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 was, uh, 
I've told this before on the show, but like when I first made it, my fiance didn't think anyone was going to know who I was because it's yeah. such an inside joke. So when I got the response that I did, I was just dumbfounded. I was like, oh my God, pe- people know. <laughs> yeah, because it's actually one of the greatest things about that entire series was that. Right. How it ran from thing. I mean, because I watched the entire one, uh, all of the seasons with my uh, my daughters. Right on. Who were little at the time, so. Sure. <clears throat> Other than their all girly, super girl things, it was like the one thing that they would watch with me and kind of like. Yeah. <laughs> all right, we'll watch that with dad because dad likes that and. You know, we can tolerate it. Sure, sure. Hey, whatever works. <laughs> I mean, I had my one daughter, like, kind of like Justice League. There you go. It's a nice. it's a semi win. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, and then the old Teen Titans. Now they actually they like the new Teen Titans go better. Yeah. Because they just you know they also still watch SpongeBob at seventeen. So sure, sure. <laughs> right on. So what what brought you to Florida then? If you've been all around living in all these different places. I, uh, a job. I was living in, uh, Colorado at the time and, uh, the Parsons Brinkerhoff job kind of went sideways mm-hmm. uh, and, uh, and like another company that was doing the same thing in, out of Florida, right. but bigger and for more money, um, hired me and moved me down. So they came in, packed up my whole house and moved me to Tampa. I had seven days to find a house. Sheesh. So, yeah, that was a little bit of a whirlwind. So, yeah. Sure. And how long were you in Florida? I wound up being there a decade because I was in real estate development. That's what had moved me down there. Right. And, uh, yeah, within, what, two and a half years, it's when the market went kaplunk. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, not only was did it go kaplunk, I was – then stuck in a house that I was about $300,000 upside down on. Sheesh. Awful. Yeah. So it took me a while to be able to get out from underneath that. And, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> and then by that time, my kids and their mom had moved up here. Right. And I was like, yeah, they're starting high school. I, I kind of was I, – I didn't think I was going to be coming up, but then – um some things happened in my personal life. To, I was like, you know what? There's really nothing – no reason to stay down here and every reason to go up there and be up there for them while they're in high school. So Sure, absolutely. So outside of the 18 years you spent where you're from, was Florida the longest you stayed in a place? Only by about four months. Really? Yeah, I was in Colorado for almost as long. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. What, is, was... what is Colorado like? Heaven. Because <laughs> I've never been. I'm going later this year. I have a friend who lives there. Where? And, uh, in Colorado Springs. Okay. Yeah, so I'm going to go Colorado visit him. Springs is interesting. Yeah? Okay. Yeah, it's not completely indicative of the rest of the state. Okay. It's like its own little thing. Yeah, it's very religious. Oh. I should say it has a, a very high num- – a high percentage of the population is very religious. Gotcha. That's very funny being my friend. <laughs> yeah, like I said, it, it's not everything. Sure, but, sure. But gotcha. You'll have a lot of, it, yeah, and it, again, I haven't been there and you know, it's been a good 10, 11 years since I've been there, so who knows. Right. What part did you live in? Uh, I lived in Boulder. Okay. Boulder, uh, in Boulder County. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I lived at first, I lived in Boulder for several years and then the real estate in Boulder buying a house was ridiculous. So I, I, it's like four miles from where I used to live in Boulder, but it's called, La, it's Lafayette. Okay. Gotcha. So it was only four miles. So, gotcha. Uh, okay. And, uh, yeah, so I had, I, I owned two houses while I was living there. So, uh, huh. How is the air? I've heard it's thin. Not, the after, not, not after about three weeks. Yeah, after you acclimate? Yeah, you don't feel it at all. The only the thing is, if you're out there, just drink a lot of water. Okay, that is a good tip. Uh, right. Yeah, that's, you know, the air, the air sickness will only really hits you if you're dehydrated. And you don't realize how fast you get dehydrated. That's the point. Sure, sure. That's pretty neat. Yeah, I didn't know that. I'm glad I got this tip. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you... 
do a ton of leatherworking. How do you even start? Was it something you just picked up randomly? It was like, I want to learn to do this. How did that, how did you start this? I wanted to join one of the Gasparilla pirate crews. Oh, sweet. And so I was putting together a, you know, pirate outfit. Mm -hmm. Uh, And uh, I had done, so I started it for Halloween. I threw, you know, something decent together through Halloween, but I wanted to make it a lot better to do pirate festivals. Sure. And I went to, what was that place called that was in Tampa there? There was, used to be, I know that it's closed. There used to be a costume shop in Tampa. Okay. uh, South Tampa. Um, And I went down there because everybody told me to go there to look at for a baldric and a belt. Mm -hmm. And they wanted an outrageous amount of money, like 250 bucks for both of those things. And they, and they were awful. (laughs) Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they were awful. I mean, it wasn't even real leather. It was like that press crap. It was just terrible. Sure. And I was like, oh, you got to be kidding me! And I had gotten. We'll go back to it. Mm-hmm. In Boy Scouts, I had gotten my leatherworking merit badge. Hey, I remember, you know, some of the basics of doing it. And I'm like, there's got to be a Tandy leather around someplace. Sure. So I went to Tandy, bought you know a hide, a strap cutter, you know, basic stuff. I think I spent like seventy five bucks. Sure. And uh, I watched Pirate. I was freeze frames Pirates of the Caribbean, you know, for about an hour and a half. Yeah. Just doing freeze frames, you know, sure. looking at it, just looking at how it was made and how it was put together, figured out a design, put it together, wore it out. And uh, I, I mean, I got a lot of people stopping me going, oh my God, where'd you get that? Where'd you get that? I'm like, I made it. Right. Can you, <laughs> can you make me one? Um, sure, I guess. Right. And started doing that and just took the money and bought more tools and whatnot. And I mean, I was working full, you know, I was still, you know, vice president of sales and marketing at the time. Yeah. Yeah. It was just something I was dabbling around with and, uh, just kept reinvesting all that, you know, we go out and buy more tools or more, you know, leather or more dyes. uh, Sure. Then it just snowballs into becoming a leather worker. Yeah, pretty much. That's pretty cool. That's interesting because I always wonder with people who have like those types of skills, like what what got you into that sort of thing. And that's that's interesting. It was a it was a costume you were making, and then got more authentic. It's also I love how your brain works in that like because you've done it with Lord of the Rings stuff as well, where you'll look at something and you'll just freeze frame it, and you're like, okay, because you have like an artist brain where you can imitate. It's pretty cool. Well, the Lord of the Rings stuff is the first one, and the, uh, the 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 if you go, uh, I think you know, full on cosplay, I guess. Yeah. Was the Athelian Ranger? Yes, which is and amazing. That was probably six months of thinking about it and looking at pictures and doing research and all that before I ever even touched anything. Sure. How long did that costume take to put together? Because it's a lot of parts. Uh, once I started, I mean, it, it was the thinking about it that sure. took the longest. I mean, once I started, I had it not to the point where I think I had it. Um, and I, I worked on that on and off probably for like three or four months. Sure. So for, for me, that's like the longest I've ever taken on anything. Sure, sure. Was that first one. So like the Thorin one, I probably thought about Thorin for like two weeks or for two months rather. Uh-huh. And once I decided to do it, I think I knocked it out in like four or five days. That is insane. Good luck. Yeah, but I did have a little bit of help on that because, like, back then I, I, like, I had Claire, right, uh, um, and a couple other seamstresses that I partnered with, and I would do their leather working, and they would help me with doing some of the sewing. Gotcha. <clears throat> so okay. Like, she like knocked out that cloak for me. Uh, you know, his big heavy cloak. That's the over thing. Sure. And, uh, you know, so, and then, like, another piece. She knocked those out for me in, like, two days. Wow. But, then I did, but at the time, I think I traded – I was doing the leather working on one of her first Wonder Woman, armored Wonder Woman. Right, right. That's cool. So, yeah. I, so every time – do you attack every project the same way and that there's, like, a long period of thinking no. about it and then it's go-to? No. Okay. <laughs> I never do anything. I have no rhyme or reason, man, how I do anything. That's good. Uh, 
that, that's a true artist. You're like, I just do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, for me, it's a lot of it comes that's the uh, even decide, you know, the inspiration to do something. Sure. The longest. There'll be times that I'll go a long time and just like, like I'm in one of those right now. I haven't made anything new. And, uh, you know, that's a full, like, cosplay type thing. Now, I've done kits for steampunk events. Right. I've been getting hired to do a lot of those lately. Cool. Um, but I don't really count those. They're just right. kind of, you know, pers- like like a persona kit type of thing. Uh-huh. That's not quite the same thing. Right. Um, <clears throat> but, like, I remember I was I was – Sitting around, and uh, this is while I was still in Florida. Uh-huh. And I remember I was like having a, a Facebook chat with somebody. Sure. I just said, you know what it was? It was Erica. Remember, you know Erica? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So with Erica, and she was asking me, so what's your next, you know, cosplay? She's always got 14 of them. Oh, yeah. Her. Yeah. <laughs> she's like a machine. She is. And she's like, well, what's your next big one? And I was like, to be honest with you, I have absolutely no idea. And you know how you should do when you're having one of those conversations. You know, you're flipping through the channels or something. Or you oh, throw yeah. Netflix up, right? Mm-hmm. So I thought Netflix, <clears throat> and you know, like how they have the featured thing when it's new yes. on Netflix? Well, I hadn't had Netflix on for a while, and I flew it up, and Harlock. Oh, yes. You know, with the big, with the big the you know, kind of cut shot. Yeah. It goes up like that. And I'm like, what is that? That looks interesting. So I throw that on, and I'm sitting there talking to her, and I'm not paying close attention to the screen. Right. And it's the part where he jumps off the ship. Oh, and yes. He lands with the big cape flashing and everything. And I'm looking at it, and I'm looking at it, and I'm like, I start typing, and I go, Erica, I know what my next cosplay is going to be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, I mean, it was like how it went down. Um, sure. That one, I kind of kicked the idea around for that for a little bit. <clears throat> but the build on that one was that was that pushed a bunch. Sure. Uh, new stuff. And uh actually I worked with Claire on that one too because she liked the idea of I, I had her watch it with me. Sure. And she did Kai. Oh, sweet. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, at the same time and we kinda like she like kinda moved into my house for a week. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, and she had because we, like we both had other things that we were working on too, and commissions and whatnot. And we, I think we knocked that thing out, no, both of those out in a week. Wow! <laughs> For ShadowCon, that is insane. Yeah, and it was like the first time I ever worked with uh, thermoplastic on his like armored vest, gold vest that's underneath all that. Yeah, yeah. And we had a sculpt. Claire did some sculpting. Um for certain elements and we cast them and tried to cast uh, them in fiberglass and uh, our molds didn't come out so well. So they kind of are all kind of like chewed up looking. Yeah. <laughs> which, which, which played well, you know, for us. Uh, weathered. Weren't. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's pretty but much how costumes shame. work. <laughs> I remember her, uh, her sculpts being so gorgeous and clean. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is going like, to oh, be amazing. Okay. I go, yeah, but I mean, the, the you know, we did we did the judging thing and did the pre-judging, and they weren't, you know, I remember the judges going absolutely crazy about everything. And, sure. You know, we won it. We won ShadowCon with it. So. Sweet. Rightfully so. Those costumes are insane. That cape alone yeah. is really, really cool. Yeah, I mean, that, that cape, the cape, okay, so the cape, the cape is cool. Yes. Uh, and the collar's a pain in the ass. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it was one of those things that, I really wish I could have done it out of the leather that I wanted to do it out of. Sure. Um, but the leather I wanted to do out of, I couldn't find a good hide for. And the one that I did find that was perfect was going to be like $400 just for the hide. Yee. And I'm like, oh, I can't. I don't know I have it. So it's it's kind of like a, a synthetic. Sure. Boat, like vinyl kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So it, I can't do that nice. I wanted to be able to do that kind of swirl and snap. Yeah. yeah. Uh, which, but it whatever. Sure, <laughs> it still <laughs> looks good. Yeah. So I know nothing about different kinds of leather. I've heard veg tan, and then there's not. Explain this to me. Teach me about leather. Uh, well, vegetable. It's veg tan is vegetable tan. So it's okay. extracts from vegetable materials. 
is used in the tanning process. Okay. That's where you'll get like that stiff um, kind of the leather that I tool. Uh huh. Okay. Uh, that. So that's what I like, like. Like I make the maps out of anything that's tooled or, or embossed or that kind of stuff is generally that. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> the other type is chrome. It's use a chromium uh, base, and that's where you get like upholstery. Okay. Softer leather, um, garment leathers, mm-hmm. that type. Um, now those generally will be dyed when you get them in a kettle. Gotcha. So they're dyed all the way through. Now that's not to say you can't find occasionally whole hides um, of veg tan that have been dyed in a kettle, which is nice when you can find them because, like, if you know you cut it, it, the dye goes all the way through. Right. You know. Um, but that's the real main difference. Gotcha. Okay. Which leather is your favorite to work with? It depends what you're making. Yeah. You know. And it really does. It's just I, I don't have a favorite. I mean, you can only do the tooling and the artwork that I do on veg tan. Right, right, right. Because the other ones too, it's not as stiff. It, yeah, it's impossible. I mean, it only you can only do that on on the thicker veg tans. Gotcha. Uh, <clears throat> and yeah, so a lot of people don't understand that. So they they bring me stuff that's already tied and collared and sealed. And hey, can you do tooling on this? No. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not possible. I cannot. We it's do like, I can... and attach it to this, but no, you cannot. Right. <laughs> I can that draw it with sailed. a sharpie. <laughs> yeah, that ship has sailed. Yeah. <laughs> so, am I? It, 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 did I hear correctly a while back somewhere that genuine leather is actually like the lowest grade of leather? Like when you see wallets made of genuine leather, is that like not good leather? Because that's what I've heard. I, I always just thought that, that they're just trying to distinguish the fact that it's not synthetic. Gotcha. See, I heard somewhere that it was like the scraps parts of leather, like the not great parts, that's genuine leather. And then they go up from there. Well, you know, my opinion on that is it all depends what it's being used for. Sure. Because, you know, scraps just could mean small pieces uh, quality is depending on what you're actually using it for. Sure, that makes sense. You know, um, yeah. So it really does depend. Gotcha. <clears throat> so okay. You, can get, you know, there's different ones too. You can get like you know cowhide. You can get, especially when you're talking about chrome tan stuff. Uh-huh. You get all kinds of stuff. You get deer, elk, um, leathers made out of all types of things. Sure. Um, bison, bull. Um, you what, know, it what, all depends. What's the hardest one to work with? Deer, deer skins are hard, uh, yeah. because they are stretchy, but they are, cause if you, if you look at a piece, right. And you think about the compass points, uh-huh. if you put a compass rows on a, on a flat piece of deer skin, right. Two of the, either, either depending on the orientation, either the North South if you pulled it in those two directions, yep. it'll stretch more than if you go east west. Really? Yeah. So when you're trying to, you know, figure out how it's going to lay, or depending on what you're doing with it, you have to take into consideration the fact that one direction will stretch more than the other. Oh, okay. And that, so that gets a little bit complicated, especially if you, you know, are making a, a wearable piece. Sure. Because you got to take into consideration. Yes, this is how it is now. But you know, after you wear this for 25 minutes it's going to be a lot looser and it's going to stretch and it's going to only stretch more in this direction so it, it gets a little complicated sure like making moccasins and whatnot out of deer skin I oh, wouldn't yeah. Recommend. <laughs> yeah by the end you just have like flimsy socks <laughs> yeah yeah gotcha okay so yeah, i didn't know that but it makes sense that there's like a grain to it essentially but one way is more flexible than the yeah, other I mean, then there's stuff that's just extremely expensive that I see every time that I go in the place that I keep going to myself, yeah, one day I'm going to actually get a eye of that and make really gorgeous things. But yeah, yeah. Some so, of that, the, the bison, the pebble, the pebble uh, grained bisons. Uh huh. Oh my God, they're gorgeous. Really? Oh yeah. And I just see like messenger bags and gorgeous things being made out of those. And I'm like, yeah, I can't afford it. <laughs> <laughs> you, just, you just look at it, you're like, one day, one day as you walk out. <laughs> yeah, I just need somebody to commission, you know. So they sure. pay for the materials. Right. 
your your gauntlets that you make what what kind of leather are those uh well which ones oh they're all different well yeah. interesting <laughs> okay for the most part for the most part everything that i make is out of the veg tan okay uh, and it'll be out of varying thickness okay so, uh, it comes in varying thickness so the, the the thinnest stuff that i use for the veg tan that i use for the maps uh -huh. that i make like the Thorn map or the Narnia or sure. Neverland are the ones, the most popular ones. Mm -hmm. And that'll be like a two to three ounce. Okay. So basically what they do is they cut a square, a, a, a specific square out of it, and they weigh it, and that's the weight. You can either go by the millimeter. Some, sometimes they go by the, the millimeter of thickness, but, but since a, it, that's a kind of a misnomer mm -hmm. because – it's, it's no piece of leather is consistently the same thickness all the way through. Right. Because, you know, it's skin. It's an animal, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's skin. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so two to three ounce is generally pretty thin, floppy, like those maps. Right. Uh, you get, then you get like the four to five ounce. That's still pretty thin. Um, sometimes I'll make the top hats that I make. Yes. Out of four to five because I do the – um, I sew them together backwards, have to wet, um, wet them completely through so they get really floppy and then turn them inside out ah. source to, to kind of stiffen them. Right. Um, to, while they're drying. That makes sense. And you don't want a real heavy hat because <laughs> over time, <laughs> you know, Yeah. Um, then you get into like, uh, um, you know, six to seven ounce, um, that's kind of like a, a, what you'll see for some of the gauntlets type of thing. That's a little on the lighter side, but you'll definitely see that seven to eight, you're getting into armory kind of thickness. Mm -hmm. Um, I do a lot of tooling on that stuff for flat surfaces. And I also, for like the, um, the bracers that I do, the tool bracers, I use a lot of eight to nine, anything above that, then you're into like SCA kind of. Right. Levels or saddles. Gotcha. You know, like, when it gets that thick. So that'll tell you about the thickness of it. Then the other thing that you got to consider when you're looking at a high level leather is the temper. And that's the stiffness. Okay. So you can have a very light leather that's got a high temper that's still kind of stiff. Right. Or, I mean, you can also have a, a seven to eight that's got the temper so low that it's this big, this big floppy mess. Um, and depending on what you're using it for, you want a high temper or low temper. Sure. Um, and then the, the last characteristic of it that, that I take into consideration is, you know, the, the amount of blemishes. Sure. And the, um, you know, kind of the purity. For the stuff I do, I don't need it to be perfect. Mm -hmm. You know, pristine, monochrome colored, you know, like some some people do, and that's what they need it for, and they want it for, right? <clears throat> and you pay for it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I'll take the seconds, no problem. It's going to have some kind of, you know, a lot of them will have brands in them, right? Or or marks holes. Um, but when I'm buying a whole side of a cow, right? You know, I can work around that. Gotcha. Okay. And you get, I'm assuming, everything from Tandy. For a lot of it. From yeah. Tandy. The like the premier yeah, leather. I, I like. It. Well, because I like to like to be able to go in and and look at it. Sure, and that makes sense. Itself. Sure, you know, there's, there's cheaper ways to do it, but unless you're buying like it by the pallet, right? Um, yeah, I just it's better uh, for me. I just like to go in and look at it. Yeah, it makes sense that we can get. It's like <laughs> that the the age old story of buying something online and then when it shows up, it's totally different. You don't want to be doing that when you're talking leather. Well, and yeah, exactly. And you, you know, you, there's a big difference between, um, you know, individual hides in the same lot, even. Yeah, for sure. You know, the shape, the, all that different thing I just mentioned uh, varies from piece to piece. So. Sure, that makes sense. That's really cool, though. I knew none of this stuff. <laughs> that is neat. I'm surprised you haven't done more with it. Yeah, oh. I don't know. I'm intimidated, which is weird. Because my dad does, like, all this sort of stuff. But I was like, I'm going to have a leather worker on, and I'm going to learn everything. Well, then there's then there's the other thing. There's, like, uh, the utility sides. Oh, sure. That can be done with a kind of an oil, like an oily mm -hmm. uh, 
um, finish to them so right. that they're kind of semi-waterproof. Smart. So, like, when we were talking about Braum way back in the day, his armor. Right. I would have used a chrome under layer, uh-huh. like a, a shirt part that I would have built it on, and then I would have used the oil, uh, oil tan, which is still another chrome, but thicker, higher temper, and I would have cut out those individual um, <clears throat> squares. Right. And done it with that. Now, conversely, I could have gone with a veg tan with that and used a stain with a kind of a gel antiquing on it to kind of age them all up, uh-huh. learn them by hand, and then stitch them on. Gotcha. Okay. So there's oh, a lot okay. of different ways to do things. Yeah. Oh, oh absolutely. Sure. sure. Yeah. As with any art. That's but that's how I did – that's also how I did uh, the Night Watch one that I did for Troy. Yes. Yes. Gotcha. That was, and that was brutal. Yeah. <laughs> I, I missed that, like, three-quarters of that con because it took me so much longer to hand-stitch all that. Sure. Man, I, is is that I, the hardest thing I that you've worked was, on as far as, like, uh, work time? It, it may be the one that I was the most off on my estimate on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a good way to put it. <laughs> yeah, because I had given myself, like, eight to ten hours mm-hmm. to do all that, which normally should be plenty. Sure. And I probably had 30 Sheesh. in that um, because it was such a pain in the ass. Yeah. <laughs> It's just, it's a it's meticulous that's for sure, plate well, and plate and plate yeah, and plate. It was that flat it was that flat um, stitching cord. Yeah, that wants to twist it so every single time you can't just do it and go. You know, it was every single time and having to get in there and make sure it was laying right. And, oh, oof. Yeah. <laughs> it, it was brutal. It was absolutely brutal. I was ready to kill somebody at the end of that. Sure. Hey, it looks good. But he loved it. he loved it. Yeah, and it did look good. That's it right. Good. You did well. You did well. Well, can you believe we've been talking for over an hour already? Uh, yeah. It goes by. goes by. Not bad at all. So, uh, you know, I don't want to keep you any longer. I always feel bad taking people's time. Uh, I appreciate you coming on. This was this was really cool. I learned a lot. I didn't good. know I didn't know any yeah, of this thanks stuff. For having me. Of course, of course. We'll have you back anytime you want. Um, yeah. Where can people find you online? Uh, right now, just Facebook. Facebook. Mickey Flint. Yeah. Yep. Sweet. Yeah, I'm just doing, uh, you know, one-off commissions at this point. Right. I, uh, yeah, right now, I'm actually, uh, it's seasonal, so I'm off, not working, probably until April. Oh, right on. So, yeah, now's a good time. Now's a good time. Now's a good time. Sweet. Well, thanks again. You the best. <laughs>